Hello and welcome to the Fast Break pregame show. My name is Amon Kidwai, manager of the UConn blog and the Fast Break newsletter, and I'm joined by our basketball writer, Patrick Martin. This is the second show of our postseason after the Big East tournament and opening two rounds of the NCAA tournament. The Huskies are now shipping up to Boston for the Sweet 16 after handling their business in Brooklyn. This show is a production of the Fast Break newsletter, an outlet featuring in-depth reporting, analysis, and a podcast about UConn men's basketball, and sponsored by 22 Threads, purveyors of fine t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and other gear inspired by the Connecticut culture and lifestyle. They recently launched a new line of Hassan Diara gear that you should all go check out. That's 22threads.com. All right, after beating Stetson and Northwestern comfortably, UConn is looking ahead to a matchup with San Diego State National Championship rematch. They have a chance to make the Elite Eight for uh, in consecutive seasons for the first time since 1999. Donovan Klingen has been on a tear lately. So have Tristan Newton and Steph Castle. Patrick, how are you feeling about the state of the team after this Northwestern win? What are the odds UConn's Instagram or socials team puts uh, the Dropkick Murphys song onto their their walkout? One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. That that that's the best odds I'll, I'll ever take on that. Uh, but I do want to open my little segment with a dad joke for you here. Please just oblige me. Uh, how do you seek sink a buoy? You tie Steph Castle to it. Ooh, you tie a castle to it. Nice. You tie a castle to it. Yeah. Uh, but no, for real, poor, poor Boo Booey, man. You know, first team all Big Ten, great player. That looked like the most miserable experience <laughs> ever for your last college game. I mean, you've got a 6 6 future lottery pick in Steph Castle on you, like the second you cross half court. And you're a really good player. So, like, when you do get by him, you have a rangy, lighter than he's ever felt healthy healthiest he's ever been donovan Klingon waiting for you in the paint and on the off chance that steph heads to the bench you have a pit bull and hassan diara snarling at you almost face guarding you and beyond that you're getting shaded and hedged every single screen you got doubles even triple teams flying out of nowhere it, it really was a team-wide master class in how to shut down a star and that's something that UConn will probably have to go back to with Jaden Ledee against San Diego State. Can you talk about the job Steph did on Boo tonight? Oh, he was terrific. He was the, I mean, he's, I think he's the best freshman in the country, and now he's proven to be one of the best defenders in the country, too. And um, he did a terrific job on him, his size, his physicality that he used against Boo, and um, he really didn't let him get comfortable. So, um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, what he did for what he did defensively really changed the game for us and allowed us to get out into open and you know get that lead going. I mean, a lot. I mean, I, I said before the game that I was going to try to uh, you know hold them hold them to the zero field goals in the first half, and you know that, that's what I did. I mean, my, my teammates believed in me. You know, they, they gave me the confidence. I mean, I had BC behind me, you know, just you know, running him off the line. You know, he's a great two point shooter, so you know, just I was really focused on you know ch- trying to take him away from his game, run him off the line a little bit. I mean, and BC helped me, and you know, big part in that. You know, he had eight blocks. I mean, he's a great defender, so I feel like uh, it was a team effort. Yeah, um, Steph and Hans did a great job on number zero. Um, you know, he, he was forcing shots, and Donovan was in the paint blocking shots. And, you know, they're, they're in the Big Ten. They don't play uh, good transition defense. So uh, we just knew we, that was a key goal in our uh, game plan, getting out of transition. And we pushed it, and um, it worked out well. It was great to see UConn like, handle the vaunted physicality of a Big Ten team, which also bodes well for this upcoming Mountain West clash. It was also great to see two straight games of fast starts where the the win probability was up in the high 90s in the first five minutes. And that's half the battle for a top seed when avoiding upsets. And it's great to see also considering like how UConn started and struggled in the Big East tournament. We all remember how brutal that Marquette game was to start. He spotted Xavier 10 points in the in the quarterfinals. Um, so that's great to see some progression there, and you know that's something Hurley has drilled into the team. I have to I, – I have legally obligated to talk about the 3-for-22 shooting night uh, because I think there's a lot of context here, and, and it's a lot to unpack. And I thought about it like the 
the the two guys on the bus meme where one's really happy looking out the window at the sun and the other's distraught looking at darkness. And, and it's really how you look at it with, you know, saying three for 22 shooting, but they also shot close to 70% from the field and they still won by, by 17 points. Caravan is now two of 12 in his last three. Spencer's four for 15. Newton is six for 19. Obviously, those three, regardless of their shots falling, they find ways to impact the game. Cutting, Spencer's passing, Newton getting to the line. But I have two thoughts about the shooting slump, and it's it's nothing breathtaking, but I think it, you have to talk about it because for anyone that panics, you always have to offer that context. Um. UConn is so established inside and they were blowing Northwestern out that those threes weren't necessary. Not that they were like bad shots, but they just weren't, they were all in the flow of the transition. But when you're up by 20, it's a lot harder to lock in and fire up threes when you're up by seven and you need that separation. I'm not saying that's an excuse and Hurley would never say that, but you're just more dialed in when when the game isn't analytically final. And the second point I have is, it's really comforting to not be a live by the three, die by the three team. UConn has 108 points in the paint in its last two games. That's leads the Sweet 16 teams and leads the second place Marquette by 20. Uh, the driving and passing lanes will continue to be wide open if you pound the paint like that. It's like establishing the run in football where that opens up slants across the middle or a go route. You keep pounding the ball inside. You keep driving to the rim. You get Kling Kong doing his thing in there. Castle and Newton working through ball screens in space. Caravan making cuts. All of that attention is going to gravitate towards the paint and keep the spacing pristine for UConn shooters. And you know Hurley is going to keep giving them the greenest of green lights to shoot out of these slumps. And that means there's going to be one game, hopefully soon, where UConn shoots the absolute cover off the ball, and you don't need to go inside to cling in as much. And that is the that is the UConn realized Death Star, where you got Big Don getting his double double inside, but UConn's also firing thirty five percent from three, and there's just simply no beating that. I will say, yeah, de- definitely not uh, overly concerned about the lacking three point performance in that Northwestern game. All the confidence in the world in in those guys, Spencer and Caravan to pick it up. And I'm just, you know, beyond even the takes that you had, which I agree with, I think it's just a law of average thing. You know, they've, they've had some cold stretches throughout the season. It's been a little bit independent of, of who the opponent is. It's happened against uh, even a DePaul uh, or, or that kind of team in the past, which kind of speaks to your initial theory, but it's also happened against some of the better teams. Uh, but yeah, UConn's ability to power through it, the most impressive and important thing, in my opinion, winning <laughs> winning the game, having such a large margin despite not shooting well from three. That's actually amazing when you when you think about it to have been up by double digits basically the entire time without hitting many threes. Absolutely insane uh, to send Boo Booey uh, out at the end of his college career like that, two for fifteen from the field. That is rough, man. That is that's like how Jerry McNamara. Ended his college career, uh, you know, with a with an offer in a in an NCAA tournament upset. Oh yeah, the the hate for that guy runs deep over here. Uh, but that that was kind of the best comp that I could come up with. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be blasting my dropkick Murphys. I'm thinking about the movie The Departed. I'm not a co-op. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be back in Boston, hanging out with the friends from college. That was like around that era, right? The Departed is coming out, uh, so it's it's going to be a crazy time up there. Uh, but we have got to, Patrick, talk about Donovan Klingon. You mentioned it briefly. It's really the uh, straw that is stirring this drink right now, even though UConn has so much star power and so much to lean on. He posted a double-double in the first half of this Northwestern game. He did the same in the Marquette Big East Tournament Championship game. Uh, he's been... Scoring at a high level as well lately, which I think has been huge, and avoiding the foul trouble. What have you liked out of Donovan Klingon lately that's been uh, behind this resurgence for him or or ascendance for him? He didn't just have a double double in the first half; he had a double double in the first his first thirteen minutes. 
it, it, it's absurd the level of efficiency he can have he can have when he's playing his best ball um 16 and a half points per game 11 rebounds per game eight blocks per game at a 78 percent clip in his in the first two games of the 2024 tournament you really have to give the coaching staff kudos for bringing him along slowly after his two injuries you have to give kudos to Samson Johnson for being a more than capable rim running alternative that keeps him fresh and has defenses guessing about what the different looks will be. But if there's one player on UConn I want playing their best basketball right now, it's Donovan Klingon. I think we were all kind of waiting for like the Steph Castle show in March, especially like, okay, he's up to speed. He's, he's, he's past his knee injury. He's going to take over. I, I was even expecting like a Cam Spencer just to take a blowtorch to the tournament now that he's finally in it i i really didn't have Klingon playing his best ball because i i i listened to the scouts that kind of that were starting to form these take quakes that oh well he's kind of limited offensively he's more of like a defensive center and that was resulting him in sliding in in mock drafts for this coming uh june Donovan Klingon, get ready to learn lottery, buddy, because he is now on ESPN's top five uh, going to the Portland Trailblazers, I believe, because he's showing all of these little things that will make that translate to the next level. The form on his free throws is excellent, shooting 72% in his last three games. And he's not a Zach Eady that just parks his ass in the paint and doesn't move. He's out there on the perimeter. He's navigating ball screens. He's negotiating space, moving his feet. I I, I compare it to the way that I don't think UConn fans fully realized how special and unique Andre Jackson was with his ball handling and athleticism. We're going to realize that when he leaves, how special his mobility on defense really is. This is not normal for a 7'2 dude. And enjoy the ride and the fact that he's from Bristol, the fact that he's this jolly green giant is just icing on the cake. Yeah. I mean, I I think his offensive prowess gets underrated because he doesn't have the, uh, you know, like, again, we talked about at the very beginning of the scene, he doesn't have this like completely polished offensive low post skill set, as if, you know, as if that's a a requirement on someone to have at the age of 19, uh, you know, being seven foot two. But he's a great passer. He's a smart offensive player. He works within the system. I mean, I am not a basketball strategy knower by any means. But the fact that you you would put your seven foot two guy even outside of the paint at all to handle the ball and uh, you know again move the offense forward, I think he handles that and has handled that across the season extremely well well right now what he's doing is just finishing a little bit better uh, i think he's it's it's not like it's not like over time he has developed some amazing skill set or some like go-to moves or anything he's just a little bit more solid a little bit more stick to i think with kind of like rebounds and putbacks uh but yeah it's it's been absolutely great to see i i felt like in the early rounds there was a chance that we'd see some donovan Klingon games especially because some of those earlier opponents tend to not have big men. What we know, though, is that uh, a lot of college basketball, sometimes uh, even a better team doesn't have a true big man. So I think that's an advantage that UConn can continue to ride throughout the tourney. And I mean, I think to your point about like a Klingon game versus, a, you know, maybe there's a Steph Castle game in the future. Maybe there's a maybe there's a Caravan 25 spot in the future. Uh, all of that is possible, and that's kind of the whole team's the whole team's working theory. But it still does hinge on Donovan Klingon being there doing what he does, so that one or two of the other guys can shine. And so, I think that's that's what we've been seeing lately is that that additional opportunity for other folks to shine because uh, Klingon has been taking care of business and then some down low. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of fun out there the other night. You know, our guards, our you know, perimeter defense was great. You know, forcing the guys to, you know, come in the paint and let me protect the rim, which is, you know, the game plan. Um, you know, but, you know, it was fun out there, you know, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes and give my all to help this team win. Unbelievable. Um, I've never seen that many blocks in a game for sure, but, uh, you know, his rim protection and, and rebounding and 
uh, you know, threat uh, on the offensive end, on the rim, uh, was unbelievable, and you know, it does so many great things for our team. Yeah, I mean, you just, you, you just realize who your next opponent is, and you just realize what your goal is, and um, you know, you don't, you don't get complacent. You don't think about what happened last game. You just keep moving forward and keep you know pushing for the future, and um, you know, just trying to. Just trying to stay hungry and keep winning and winning and winning. I mean, I know everyone in this locker room wants to, you know, win. And, you know, that's just one thing that's about, you know, so special about this team is everyone's so unselfish and everyone's willing to give everything they got to you know, go out there and win. So heading into Thursday's matchup with San Diego State, I know that this is a team, of course, that UConn has some familiarity with, but uh, always in a new year, you'll have to respect how a team may be different and what has changed. Patrick, how are you feeling about this San Diego State matchup in the Sweet 16? Bring your lunch pail, boys. It, it, it's going to be one of those types of games. Uh, the first thought that came to my mind this year was like a little bit like that prop that first game against Providence, except just San Diego State's a little bit better defensively. Uh, but in the similar mold where if you Providence, where if you shut down Devin Carter or Josh Duro, you're usually going to win. And that's how I feel with UConn and San Diego State. Um, it, it reminded me also of like the title game. Uh, the point total was 135. I wouldn't be shocked to see a similar type of outcome like that. Uh, not gambling advice, just ranging as far as the number of possessions. It starts and ends with Jaden Ledee, man. I mean, he he is a throwback to the cop to the college kid that waited his turn and developed year over year. He went from eight points per game last year to 21 points per game this year. He had 601 total points his first three years and has already at 754 this year. Put up 26 points against Yale, averaging 20, nearly 28 in his last five games. And what worries me is he takes 43% of his shots at the rim and is fifth in the country at fouls drawn per 40 minutes at 7.4. I found that really interesting also because San Diego State only has 52 points in the paint this tournament, which is second to last among the Sweet 16 teams. So it's almost like they're clearing out and letting him go to work in the middle, which is going to be such a big test for Donovan Klingon. Defensively, San Diego State, I mean, that's it's the same carryover as last year. They ranked 26 in efficient, uh, effective field goal percentage allowed, but they have kind of struggled lately. They were ranked 73rd in adjustive defensive efficiency over the last six games. And I think a lot of that inconsistency is they don't have the rim protector uh, Mensa from last year, uh, no Jaden Bradley. And I, I, I think that results in some inconsistent, you know, Say what you will about the Mountain West. It's not a power six or power five, and it hasn't really performed very well, to, to put it nicely. Um, and so what I think UConn can take advantage of is the unbalanced nature of San Diego State because there is no semblance of any type of offense beyond Jaden Ledee. Um, no one averages more than, I think, 10.4 points per game. And of the four guys who attempted 100 threes this year, only one is hitting 37%. That's Reese Waters. Yeah, they caught fire against Yale with um, Darian Trammell and Lamont Butler combining to go 6 of 10, and they hit 13 threes total. I think there's going to be a regression to the mean, and really all UConn has to do is stop Ladee from going nuclear. Um, and that's... Even beyond him going nuclear, it's more of like, just keep Donovan Klingon in the game. Ladee can give you a 30-burger as long as Klingon isn't in foul trouble and, he, and he's still in the game impacting the other areas. I'm fine with Ladee getting his. Uh, because UConn's defense ha has been insane from the interior, allowing only 21 points in the paint. Uh, again, you know, weaker competition, but still noteworthy. And that's because Klingon has been able to play without restrictions, which has a cascading effect uh, because Samson Johnson isn't being overextended as well. A couple of quick scenarios of like how this could play out. A world we don't want to live in is head coach Steve Dutcher, uh, Dutcher, Dutcher throws Klingon into like a million ball screens. He picks up two quick fouls. 
Ladiz, a big dude at 6'9". Uh, he's a strong guy. His strength is too much for Samson, and small ball won't work with Alex Caravan. Jalen Stewart, freshman, maybe picks up a couple of fouls. That allows San Diego State to set its half-court defense, and there's a little more side-to-side stagnating ball movement with UConn as opposed to like the penetrating vertical passes that we've come to see. And that just means it's another gross, disgusting rock fight that will require Tristan Newton bailout buckets or Steph Castle get into the line. That is nightmare fuel in the Sweet 16. Where I think it's more leaning towards, though, is if Klingon keeps his arms just straight up, the Aztecs struggle with that size and length, one through five, and it's a similar type of UConn will be keeping them at arm's length game flow. Also keep in mind that like Newton and Castle at 6'4 and 6'6, six, six, uh, they can bully the 5'10 Trammell and the 6'2 Butler. So maybe Ladie gets going for one run, and especially if UConn continues its shooting slump. But as long as Klingon is safe from foul trouble, UConn is safe. That's not groundbreaking analysis, but when you're, when you're as good and elite at all areas of the game like UConn is, it sometimes it really is that simple. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in the same boat because of how UConn, how good UConn is, but also, a, as you said, San Diego State, besides Ladie, nobody else too dangerous, nobody, nobody significant that you have to worry about. Not really a good recipe for trying to beat UConn. I mean, I think, like you said, it's basically like miracles and uh, outside acts of God that would be required for San Diego State to have a chance in this game. I, I really think your best bet, if you're San Diego State, is to try and arrange a kidnapping of Donovan Klingon maybe, or, uh, you know, find a way to find a way to get one of them food, food sickness, figure out, figure out what Jordan Hawkins was eating, uh, last, last April and get some of that, uh, over to Boston. I mean, Boston's not a great food city, so I think someone could, could potentially do that to him, but some, some bad chowder. Yeah. Maybe some bad chowder. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, again, it's, I, I, I was like embarrassingly confident going into the Northwestern game. I was like, this is, you know, this is just not a serious team in Northwestern. They were also a little injured uh, to, to give them a little credit for, for not putting up much of a fight. But I remain very confident going into this game because uh, UConn is much, much stronger than this team. It's, it's a, it's a complete squad. And uh, this is, this is really a one man show type of team that has not, accomplished all that much like congrats on beating Yale uh this past week uh that would have been an awkward matchup but definitely not a not a bad one for UConn uh Auburn's out of the way that was the that was the matchup that people were scared of I know there were kind of mixed opinions about that but look UConn is the danger and and that's the attitude that they have to take going into into the tournament at this point well that's going to do it for us thank you all for watching